thank you very much, and thank you very much for that introduction. As you were introducing me, I was thinking that many people probably ask themselves, what exactly do I do? <laughs> In the absence of a peace process, and what did I do that for my sins I get these jobs? I suppose it must be something that I did in my previous life. Thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Uh, Professor Garon, Professor Reichman, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak. Uh, once again, um, this forum has become one of the leading uh, uh, fora in the world for anti-terrorism experts coming together from around the world to exchange ideas. Um, and I know that yesterday, uh, one of my colleagues from New York, Jahangir Khan, spoke um, um, also at this forum, and, and I'm re lo looking forward to hearing uh, my good friend and former prime minister, former boss, uh, Boyko Borisov, the prime minister of Bulgaria, address this uh, uh, meeting today. When I looked at um, the program, I was, uh, I've often wondered um, about the use of the wor words counter in connection with terrorism or anti-connection with terrorism. I know that when people say um, anti-Semitism, anti-slavery, anti-racism, they mean that they want to abolish completely the phenomena of anti-Semitism, slavery, or racism. And I worry a little bit that when we say countering something, it sounds a little bit like a process. Um, so I want to be very uh, clear from the beginning of uh, my presentation that as far as I'm concerned, our collective goal is not just to take action to prevent um, the effects of terrorism, but to eradicate it. And I think this is something that brings everyone together um, in, this, in this room. Uh, there will always be people who will make the case or who will argue that killing random civilians can be justified because of some noble goal, religious goal, political goal, whatever. But apart from these individual acts of terror that we face um, around the world, we should really focus on what are the uh, conditions which create um, terrorism today. What is the, what is, where is the inspiration? Where is the motivation? Where, are the where is the political rationale uh, uh, for terrorism? Because people don't appear out of thin air. And they frequently originate from a network of very well uh, organized and established religious, cultural, um, or political institutions, organizations with operational infrastructures and capacities, sometimes very closely compared to military establishments. Many of them have developed over the last few years um, and have grown and reinforced themselves across national borders um, and have infiltrated communication networks, social networks, um, everything. State sponsorship for terrorism um, and non-state actors also remains a highly complex challenge that we need to, uh, to, to, to deal with um, uh, today. Last year when I attended the uh, forum, I spoke briefly of what I believe is the necessity for a new international approach on how to deal with terrorism threats here in the Middle East. Um, and I want to begin today by elaborating a little bit more on what, as far as I'm concerned, are the five main objectives of what we should do in the international system um, in order to support uh, uh, the fight against terrorism. And then I will, with your permission, speak very briefly um, about the situation um, in Gaza, which has kept me uh, busy. I don't know if I should get over uh, time pay for that. Uh, danger pay would certainly help. Um, our first task as the international community um, is really to affirm a very clear and uh, moral clarity, to have very clear uh, uh, clarity on the, the, that we have zero tolerance and we will have zero tolerance for the justification and legitimization of terrorism. And there are two aspects of this. One is the obligation of states under international law and what states should do. But then there's also the question of, of incitement. And let me start with that question first. We have an obligation not just to condemn acts of terror, but to stand up against those who condone them, who inspire them, and who celebrate them. And this is why you will hear very often Secretary General Gutierrez, myself, and others in the United Nations speak out clearly when such acts take place. To glorify terrorist attacks means to supply them with oxygen, to supply with oxygen the aspirations and, and to invite more attacks. And this is the reality which we face uh, uh, today. Political, social, and religious leaders 
uh, have a strong uh, responsibility, even if they don't actively promote terrorism in their speeches, to not be complicit with, with, it, with their silence um, and not to create an environment that legitimizes and, and encourages terror. And I think this is quite valid for everywhere in the Middle East, and I'm sure many here in this auditorium uh, will understand exactly where this argument is heading. But states also have obligations that are very clear and that have been defined in various UN Security Council resolutions and, uh, and documents. I just give you an example of Resolution 1373, which is legally binding for all UN member states. And it says that uh, governments have to prevent the commission of terrorist acts, ensure that their territory is not used for financing, planning, facilitating, or committing such acts, bring to justice and freeze the assets of those involved in such activities and refrain from providing safe havens. Now that is what it says on paper. Of course, there are very significant gaps that still remain in how we implement many of the principles that have been defined um, um, in this respect in regard to the, uh, to the responsibilities of states. I just want to uh, point out one whole area which I hope that your conference in the future will explore in greater detail, and that is the potential link between uh, terror networks and organized crimes and smuggling um, around the world. I think that is a whole new area where we need to pay much more attention, uh, much more closely than we have in the past. Our second obligation is to promote inclusive political solutions to conflicts. And this is where the role of the UN becomes critical. We must focus on delivery rather than process and on people rather than bureaucracy. And we love bureaucracy and we love process. So we really need a new approach to how we do things. Our instruments, however, that we deal with have been designed um, in a previous era. They're more, mostly focused on state-to-state -state conflicts and not about conflicts within states or within ethno-religious communities. In the Middle East, these challenges are particularly visible today. We see different uh, uh, factors coming together at the same time. We see collapsing states and imploding social structures. We see the rise of uh, religious radicalization. All of this very often prompted from out by outside interference. And all of it really creating a perfect storm that is engulfing uh, uh, the region. Uh, states, Syria, Yemen, Libya, uh, Iraq, others. States that are unable to meet the legitimate demands of their people demands for representation, for economic and social development, for security or for dignity, create space for radical groups to thrive, uh, expand, and ultimately attack us around the world from there. In June of this year, the Secretary General made, a very, made it very clear that we must come together to fight terrorism with methods that do not compromise the rule of law and human rights. International law, uh, un the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, does indeed guarantee freedom of expression. However, it very clearly also says that it, it brings with it duties and responsibilities. Duties and the responsibilities that include the respect of the rights and freedoms of others and the just requirement for public order, order and welfare, parts of the declaration that are rarely quoted in the media. Our third priority is to address the political and social economic factors that breed violent extremism. By this, I do not mean only that states need to invest in development in protecting and upholding human rights and strengthening uh, resilience of communities. I mean focusing on efforts that the underlying conditions of the, uh, uh, focusing on efforts to address the underlying conditions that have lured uh, people to the uh, agenda of radical extremists and terrorism. Marginalized communities, poverty, but more importantly, ideologies, and the perception of injustice. This needs to be certainly addressed in today's interconnected world much more uh, clearly than it has been um, um, in the past. But even all of this is not enough. We need to go further than that. And we need to focus on coordinating our efforts in the international arena uh, to address these challenges much better than we have done in the past. And focus also on financing and illicit arms trafficking and accountability and the use of social media and hate speech. These are areas where international tools, international documents and, uh, uh, and, and coordination fora are still emerging. The threats we face come across borders and that's why we need a multilateral approach. And this is where the UN should 
and must play a more clear role. And I want to assure you that Secretary, uh, Gu uh, Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, since taking into office, has focused on this agenda very, very clearly. Uh, for the first time he, in June of last year, the UN hosted a high-level conference of the heads of counter-terrorist agencies from member states. Um, in February, uh, uh, the Secretary General signed a compact with 36 uh, UN entities to significantly improve the coordination uh, of the UN system in supporting countries in countering and preventing terrorism. Also in June, the, the General Assembly, for the first time in its sixth biannual review of the global terrorism, counterterrorism strategy, for the first time condemned the use of human shields, a practic that is abhorrent and is often used by terrorists. These are just some examples, uh, but this is only the beginning. Last on my list is a priority that I'm personally very fond of, and that is a priority, a political priority, that we need to, uh, to address very clearly. We need to focus on strengthening the forces of moderation. And this is a political objective, which is particularly valid here um, in the Middle East. And again, going back to communities, to social, political, and religious leaders, they have the power with their actions, their words, to refrain to uh, uh, people to encourage them to stand up to mistrust and tension. And they have a responsibility to uphold uh, a more inclusive approach to, uh, to, to, to society. Addressing the genuine grievances um, uh, of people will also help us um, attack and counter the spreading of ideologies um, uh, of, of radicalism. And I think this is perhaps in a way our first line of defense um, in, in this respect. Over the last uh, few years, and this is where I'm, I really get excited when I look at the Middle East, and perhaps this is one of the uh, uh, justifications that gives me optimism, not just for my job, but for the region as a whole. It, over the last few years, we've seen a growing understanding among leaders in some Arab countries of the need to focus on supporting moderation, strengthening the forces of moderation, and standing up to radicalism. This is really a welcome development. It is a budding movement that needs to be supported um, and needs to be encouraged. And it could very easily become the basis of cooperation between Israel um, and its Arab neighbors, not just in the field of anti-terrorism, but in other areas um, as well. Of course, all of this is very uh, uh, theoretical. Um, and I'd like to bring it a little bit closer to home to what we're doing um, on a daily basis here. Um, on the ground, um, perhaps upholding one of the most important aspects of the work um, of the UN today, and that is uh, prevention, prioritizing preventing prevention of conflicts rather than just responding uh, to conflicts. In this context, uh, we have, over the last few months, engaged in an unprecedented effort to prevent war in Gaza. This effort which has succeeded for now because of the vital cooperation of all parties on the ground and in the region, exemplifies also many of the challenges that I spoke of earlier. The need for new instruments in dealing with conflicts, the requirement to focus on socioeconomic drivers of conflicts and humanitarian issues, the essentiality of seeking political solutions and empowering moderates over radicals. Over the past uh, couple of months, tension in Gaza, over the past few months actually, tension in Gaza has been rising rapidly. This is the result of a combination of a number of factors. The humanitarian situation has deteriorated as the economy has practically ground to a halt. A decade of Hamas control, Israeli closures, the measures taken by the Palestinian Authority, including the salary cuts that have affected some 20,000 people, the reduction of UNRWA services, and the fear that more cuts are coming breed anxiety um, and anger in the population. The constant lack of electricity, people live with uh, about three hours of electricity per day, has led to a complete shutdown of the entire sewage system of two million people in Gaza and significantly reduced hospital services. Even as we speak today, uh, uh, we're about to, 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 to be put in a situation in which the UN will no longer be in a position to provide fuel for hospitals because we've simply run out of money. The security situation has worsened. Over 170 people have been killed in protests at the fence and thousands injured. The security situation in Israel along the border with Gaza has also deteriorated with the advent of incendiary kites and balloons and other devices. 
provocations of defense, shooting incidents, and barrages of rockets coming out of Gaza, IDF responding to that, have brought us to the verge of war at least three times in the course of the last two months. This is a war that nobody needs, and, and a war that everybody must work together to avoid. The political situation has also worsened as Egyptian-led reconciliation talks between Hamas and Fatah have ground to a halt, um, and efforts to return Gaza under the control of the Palestinian Authority um, have stalled. So the combination of these humanitarian, political, and security factors is really a recipe for disaster, a disaster that nobody needs and nobody wants, uh, considering all the other security threats um, that were outlined earlier in, in, in this conference. Unless the international community, in coordination with the Palestinian Authority, with the government of Israel, with Egypt, acts immediately, the humanitarian, political, and security crisis will rapidly escalate and risk a military confrontation that will have devastating consequences for a population of two million people that has gone through three devastating conflicts already in the last uh, uh, decade. Rather than wait uh, for what seems to be an inevitable conflict, this time we decided that we are want to try and work to prevent it, not just deal with the fallout. The effort that uh, the UN has undertaken has been supported by a number of member states in the UN, by the Security Council. I brief them regularly in open and close consultation by the Secretary General, who has called on all parties to cooperate um, with us. Our goals have been very clearly defined. First, to reduce the risk of military confrontation with potential regional implications in Gaza. Second, to support Egyptian efforts to achieve reconciliation and the return of the Palestinian Authority to Gaza. And thirdly, to address all humanitarian issues. We have engaged with all sides to restore calm and sustain the 2014 ceasefire arrangements. This is necessary to address all humanitarian issues and revive the efforts uh, to empower the government. We work together very closely and foremost with uh, the Egyptian government and authorities, with Israeli and Palestinian authorities, with all parties on the ground to ensure that peace stands a chance. All sides, however, must do their part to ensure that this process um, succeeds. And that includes also uh, uh, improving movement and access restrictions and upgrading electricity and water supplies for Gaza. Over the last few weeks, I've read much speculation in the media, um, and I've heard so many conspiracy theories as to what exactly is going on in Gaza that it does give me a headache sometimes. But I uh, remember I come from the Balkans, and we're not easily scared by rumors, by fake news, and conspiracies. We have a lot of those um, uh, in our own world. Um, so today, in the world of broken mirrors that the Middle East is, I felt that it was important for me to clarify what is the reality of what the UN and um, our, our partners are doing. Hopefully, by doing this, address what is not the reality. And the reality is that we need to work day in and day out to sustain calm today in Gaza. It is not business as usual. Nobody should consider this to be business as usual. The old ways will no longer be working. To sustain calm, Palestinians in Gaza need to see some progress in their lives. Increased electricity supply, functioning hospitals, reduced movement and access restrictions, economic activity. Israeli communities near Gaza need to see progress as much as Palestinians. They need to see an immediate end to the incendiary attacks, to the kites and to the balloons, to the terror attacks of rockets and mortars. Without this calm, which is only based on the 2014 ceasefire arrangements, without this calm, the whole plethora of humanitarian issues that have been raised both by all sides connected to Gaza cannot be resolved. Without this calm, the Egyptian uh, government and the Egyptian effort to make progress on the return of the PA back to Gaza will not be possible. Without this calm, it is difficult to address the broader political uh, aspects um, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including uh, uh, the two-state um, outcome that still remains the core of uh, what the international community wants to achieve uh, in, terms, in, in order to ensure that the sustainability of peace um, here between Israel um, um, and, and, and Palestine. But let me be very clear about one thing, and with this I will end. For prevention work, whether it is in this conflict or anywhere else in the world, to work, we need all parties to cooperate.
to do their part. Throughout the past two months, in parallel to Egyptian and UN efforts to restore calm, there have been attempts to undermine our efforts, to bring Israel and Hamas into a confrontation. We must not allow these efforts to succeed. We must continue to persevere uh, very, very uh, uh, strongly. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the precarious nature of our work today. This is what keeps us um, in my office awake late at night, uh, dealing with all of these challenges. And I hope that if we succeed with the cooperation of everyone to prevent another escalation um, in the South, uh, this will have a positive uh, implication, positive result for Israelis, for Palestinians, for the political process, uh, for the lives of people who are sick and tired um, of, of the dangers that they live in, and hopefully would we'll allow, we'll allow um, uh, the region to focus on where the real challenge is. Uh, to the future of its own security and prosperity lie. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to address the conference today, and I look forward to um, the rest of our discussions. Thank you.